Welcome to the Speed and Scale podcast, where we dive deep into the stories of those driving change and innovation in our fast-paced information ecosystem. I'm your host, Baybars Orsek, and today we have a very special guest, Bledair, a pioneer in journalism and fact-checking. Bledair is best known as the founder of Poltifact, an acclaimed fact-checking website that has become an indispensable resource for verifying the claims of politicians and public figures. With a career dedicated to upholding facts in political discourse in the media, Bill's work has had a profound impact on the landscape of journalism, introducing fact-checking to media and political discourse, while encouraging many to get into the practice in different parts of the world. I'm proud to call him a friend and a mentor, as he had a significant impact on my journey as a fact-checker in the last decade. Today, we'll explore Bill's the Dino fact-checking journey into journalism, and his insights into the future of the practice, most recently embodied itself as a call to action for the community in his piece for the Neiman Lab, where he suggests that fact-checking is failing and it needs a reboot. So sit back and prepare for a thought-provoking conversation with one of the most influential figures in modern journalism, the Dean of Fact-Checking, the founder of Poltifact, and the director of Duke Report Step. Welcome to the show. Before we get going and dive deep into your recent take on why fact-checking does need a reboot and how do you see this year of elections as a test for all of us, can you offer our listeners a brief background on your journey from being a political reporter to founding Poltifact, an inspiration for many like myself around the world? Thanks for having me, Barbars. I'm honored to be uh, the guest on your first episode. Um, so the the origin story of PolitiFact is about guilt. Um, it's about my guilt when I was the Washington bureau chief of the St. Petersburg Times, the newspaper that is now the Tampa Bay Times. And, and I felt guilty that I was not doing enough to fact check the politicians that I covered in Congress and the White House. And so I went to my editors in 2007 and I said, hey, instead of covering the 2008 presidential campaign in the traditional way that we normally do, let's start a fact-checking website. And they were supportive of that. Um, I was just talking to one of them a few minutes ago uh, who was here in our hallway, uh, Paul Tash, and he reminded me that one of the keystones to our idea was that we keep it light, that we not um, be too serious, that we not be boring. Um, and that appealed to me um, because I'm not too serious. Um, and I uh, and I think one of the things I like about journalism is to simplify complex things. And so fact-checking was perfect for that. So, um, so we launched in August of 2007, and PolitiFact is still going strong today. Just remarkable. Um, I, I'm interested in your take on how do you think the technology has changed in the last 17 years since the launch of Paul the Fact, and what are the the milestones that you see in this particular era where we saw a tremendous amount of growth and fact checking, and the tactics around combating misinformation has changed. What, what is your overall take on the differences between the early days of fact-checking and where we are today right now with the speed and the scale of the problem that we have? Fact-checking is different than other kinds of journalism because it has archival value that lasts a little bit longer. So if you think about a typical news story, it's valuable now. You know, it's the news. Um, we know what's happening now. But a fact-check is valuable for a longer period of time because people want to know, is that true? Is that thing that I keep hearing true? So a fact check that we do today still has value in a week or two weeks, and it also has value in a different way. And this was one of PolitiFact's innovations. It has value to tell you um, what, how is a politician doing? How often does a politician get the facts right? And how often does a politician get the facts wrong? And so that is valuable. And from the start, I think we realized at PolitiFact that it should 
that the content should be structured like data. And this was, I think, part of the innovation of PolitiFact, um, partly my idea, but also the brilliance of a guy named Matt Waite, who was a data journalist for the St. Petersburg Times, now is a faculty member at the University of Nebraska. And so that now today is what a lot of fact checkers are doing, thanks to something that we've done here at Duke, which is share that concept um, through a data standard called claim review. And the idea is to structure fact checking so it can be found more easily in databases, whether it's through a search engine like Bing or Google or um, by anyone who just wants to take the data and create a database and look at it in different ways. And so I think fact checkers from the beginning have been particularly sophisticated at using technology. So let me ask you this. Compared to 2007, I think it is fair to say that fact-checking is a much more a mainstream and a household name. What, what do you think that has caused this practice to earn this uh, reputation within the, the broader uh, information and uh, ecosystem in which we have to deal with a lot of misinformation from the political side, from the online side, and how the practice itself um, could be in a place to tackle this problem at speed and scale? Well, I, I think it can be several different things. I think there's more fact-checking that's being done by traditional news organizations um, inside their news articles. So, and this is, I think, one of the trends of the late teens, like 2016, 2017, um, when you started seeing news articles that would say, you know, this politician falsely claimed whatever. Um, and that kind of thing never would have happened 10 years earlier. You know, n political reporters were scared to death of doing anything like that because they didn't want to they didn't want to offend their sources. So that's a good trend. Um, uh, and, and, and that happens even more today because reporters are like, hey, I can say that and not get in trouble, you know, because I think everybody realizes these politicians are just saying a bunch of false things and it's okay to say that it's false. So that's good. Um, the other thing that's happening is I think you're seeing um, lots of different things going on with technology, whether it's trying to um, push back on the different ways that politicians are, are spreading misinformation on social media. Um, and that's gotten getting much more complex, whether it's detecting fake images, um, whether it is um, now trying to, uh, in, in some cases, use our own generative AI to create fact checks. That's something we're um, uh, beginning to experiment with here at Duke is can we use generative AI to um, to basically create more fact checks every day to help fact checkers so that we it's like a, a force multiplier um, because politicians say the same things in Arizona that they're saying in Virginia that they're saying in Florida. So if it's been fact-checked in one of those states, we can use generative AI to clone that fact-check, adapt it to the new claim, and then through publishing uh, agreements, publish those fact-checks. So I think that's the great hope with technology. Um, it won't happen without humans. I do think you, you've got to put a human in the loop to make sure that those fact-checks are reviewed um, we have a product we're calling Half Baked Pizza, um, and the concept being that you need a chef to review the half baked pizza before you put it in the oven, and likewise, you need an editor to review the half written uh, fact check that's been written by generative AI, so you make sure it doesn't contain any hallucinations, um, which is sort of the equivalent of a bad pepperoni. Do you think we need more fact checkers to do more fact checks and the technology to amplify those fact checks and help to tackle this problem at speed and scale? Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't think 
there's any scenario for combating misinformation in a serious way that does not involve more fact checking. Um, and we, I mean, we just have to realize that the raw materials of combating misinformation are fact checks written by humans, you know, like AI is fine, but it's not dependable enough yet to be able to combat misinformation. And so we need more people writing more fact checks. Now that, you know, that's like a a friend uh, used to say, you know, of course, Bill's going to say that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, you know, but, but really like, I, I do think we need more fact checkers doing more fact checks. We did a report um, this past year um, here at Duke uh, called Fact Deserts, <clears throat> and it looked at the likelihood that an American politician um, other than so forget like presidential candidates, of course, they're getting fact checked a lot. Um, but how often is a state legislator fact checked? How often is a member of the House of Representatives in Congress, fact check? Answer, hardly ever. And so um, uh, governors hardly ever fact checked. So, you know, these guys can say anything they want and no one holds them accountable. Well, we need journalists to do that. And so our report showed the frequency of this, which was frightening. Um, So we need more journalists to be holding politicians accountable for what they say. Speaking of accountability, I think it's fair to say that you also offer a layer of accountability for fact checkers um, as a practice that has been um, under the spotlight for a very long time. I think the the, the, the community is very fortunate to have you ring the alarm bell in your last piece uh, uh, that you wrote for the Nemo Slab uh, earlier in the December. I, I'm just like you know, curious to hear from you your reasoning behind um your suggestion that fact checking is failing and it needs a reboot um and not necessarily to put like a verse in your mouth but i think you do that from a, uh from the perspective of like you know the communication of the work of fact checkers uh but can you provide a little bit of like you know uh reasoning on your um call to action um and ways in which the fact checkers should reboot their work so, you know, um, we we really are still publishing the way that we published fact checks 20 years ago, um, the way that factcheck.org, factcheck.org published 20 years ago, putting stuff on a website and waiting for crazy Uncle Bob to come to the website to read it. Well, hey, newsflash, crazy Uncle Bob is not coming to fact checkers websites to find that he's wrong. Um, So we've got to find out a way to get to crazy Uncle Bob. And so I think we need to be much more willing to work with behavioral scientists and look at how people are consuming information and consider different kinds of partnerships and creative ways to package fact checks. Um, Here's a wacky one. uh, we've talked about, and I, and I, this is probably way out there, but it's the kind of thing that takes the fact check to the person. Um, we've mused about, hey, why don't we um, put fact checks on um, uh, on television, on video screens at gas pumps? Um, you know, that's a screen. You could do a short fact check segment, put it there. No, you know, that's a place where. Everybody fills up their tank um, who doesn't have an electric car. And that's a way that um, you could um, target people who are not seeing fact checks other other ways. And I think we need to think, and and maybe that's too extreme and maybe that's too in your face, but I think we need to think about creative ideas like that, that are that go beyond waiting for Uncle Bob, who, you know, has some wacky COVID theory or whatever, to come to a fact checking website, because it's not happening. Um, And, and so and we know from, um, from just following um, people's habits, 
the the people who need the corrections are not going to seek out um, fact checks that tell them they're wrong. And so they're not coming to the fact checking websites. And so it's wonderful that we're putting it there as a archive, but it's not getting to the people who need it. Then let's say for the sake of the argument that we solve the, the distribution, uh, the circulation problem, we make fact checks available to more people. Uh, what about the production side of things? I mean, we, you know, said we need more fact checks. You constantly remind the importance of doing more fact checking. Um, what would be the role of like an automated fact checking or generative AI? And more particularly, I mean, what do we need to understand from automated fact checking in the age of AI and the role of AI um, in, in, in our um, efforts to tackle misinformation? Well, I think that's changed. You know, if you asked me about automated fact checking five years ago, it would be um, more like an appendix to a to content. It would be more like, hey, by the way, that thing that he just said, you know, that may not be true. Um, and and now I think um, I think we need to. Um, I guess I'm more focused on using it to generate a greater mass of fact checks and get it to um, a um, broader audience and to create more and more fact checks. But, you know, think about it. You can, um, you can use generative AI to do lots and lots of things. You can use it and write in different voices. You can generate customized newsletters you can um, write in different kinds of tones, you know, and so you could theoretically just say, okay, here's a fact check, write it for this kind of person um, and try to make it more appealing. Um, that would be along the lines of what the American Press Institute did about five years ago with an interesting experiment where they showed that the way that journalism is written can change its appeal to different kinds of audiences. So we could try that. Um, there's just been no experimentation in this area to speak of. And, and I think we need to just try different kinds of formats um, and, and just lots and lots of experimentation. How about the fact checkers role within the broader trust and safety space? I'm asking this question from the lens of how fact checkers work with platforms, platforms being the largest funder of fact checking at um, today's uh, environment. Um, do, do you think fact checking has a larger role to play within the broader uh, regulatory and um, practical trust and safety um, environment in which uh, the platforms are one of the largest uh, industry stakeholders at the same time uh, being the larger funder of the practice? Yeah, um, I think I think it's too easy for the fact checkers to just sort of wait for the platforms to say, okay, well, here's what we're going to pay you, um, sign on the dotted line. Um I think the fact checkers should get more involved with universities in testing different kinds of things. Um, I, but I think there needs to be a shift in their mentality. The fact checkers are journalists, and I think they have for too long looked upon their role as, well, we're just going to put the information out there and people will come to it and, you know, maybe they'll be swayed by it. Maybe they won't, but we're just information providers. Well, that's not good enough. Um, we, um, we need, uh, you know, our goal shouldn't just be to be this passive transmission belts of information. Our goal should be to tr get people the facts so they can know what's true. And so I think we've, and this is a change for me because I used to answer that question when people would ask it in interviews. I used to ask it by saying, oh, you know, we just put the facts out there. It's up to, you know, it's up to Mabel to decide how she wants to vote. Um, and I'm not telling Mabel how to vote at all. Um, but I do believe that we need to be more. Um, uh, I think we need to connect dots more than we have. Um, 
you know, like on um, uh, on some of these bigger issues, I think we've been very clinical and sort of said, well, this thing's wrong and that thing's wrong. And we haven't said, hey, put all these things together and what's going on? Let's wrap this up with your uh, thoughts on 2024, the year of elections. Um, we have elections here in the U.S., in India, in the European Union, uh, most likely in the U.K., I mean, in Indonesia, in a lot of um, countries all around the world, in, uh, in the global south, in which we will see a lot of factoring efforts doing an incredible work, facing a lot of challenges, uh, seeing a lot of opportunities. Some of them are will be met, some of them will be missed. What will be your ambitions in, in, as far as um, the fact-checking in 2024, accomplishing um, some of the goals or meeting some of the expectations? <laughs> we, we used to have a joke at PolitiFact um, uh, that and I would often say this in election years, but not just in election years, I would say it's the year of the fact checker. Um, and, you know, like in, and after a while people were like, didn't you say that last year? Um, and didn't you say that the year before? Um, it was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, it really is this year. Um, and so, you know, this year it's going to be the year of the fact checker. Um, and, and I, I think that I'm right actually, because, misinformation just seems to find new ways to spread faster, sneakier, um, and politicians seem to be much more willing to spread falsehoods than they have in the past. So, um, so I do think when we look back on this year, um, I think we will say, um, boy, there was an awful lot of really important fact-checking. One key to that, fact-checkers have to do a better job telling their story. Um, journalists tend to be modest, and they don't tend to do a good job telling their story. And I think this is something that we really need to do better. I think the IFCN needs to take the lead in doing this, and individual fact-checkers need to do better. But I think when it's all done, I think we'll look back on this year and we'll say 2024, it was the year of the fact checker. Bill, it's been incredible to have you on the show. Thanks a lot for being here with me today to cut the ribbon. Um, it is just always a treat and a pleasure and an honor to share a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bobbers. It was great to be on the show. Thank you for tuning into the Speed and Scale podcast. Every week, I chat with my guests on the battle against misinformation, try to highlight the tireless efforts of fact checkers, technologists, experts, researchers, regulators, and the trust and safety teams across digital platforms, showcasing the critical work to safeguard facts and accuracy in our information system. Don't forget to subscribe and connect with me on social media. Until next time.